Okay, why is gender so important? What is the work that gender does? Feminists have theorized gender because gender is particularly important in the oppression of women. So let's talk a little bit more about gender and the work that gender does and some aspects of gender. Okay. So first, gender is described in terms of appearance and constructions of gender, definitions of gender, actually determine the appearance that's acceptable for women. So there are actually, you know, societal rules about how women are supposed to look, and then there are also attitudes um, associated with certain appearances of women. Okay. So women's clothing is extremely important. What a woman wears, and also what a man wears, is really important. How they do their hair, these are ways that we sex mark. Right? Um, the size and weight is associated with masculinity and, se and femininity. So we associate tallness with masculinity and shortness and petiteness with femininity. What that means is that if a woman is very tall, they're considered less feminine. And if a man is very short, he's considered less masculine. Okay? If a woman goes about wearing a suit and tie, then she's certainly less feminine and actually going beyond less feminine to actually you know, confronting gender norms and um, rebelling against gender norms and, you know, at risk then of some sort of consequence, right? Some sort of punishment for failing to conform. Um, size and weight, right? We have very different size and weight expectations of men and women. So that if a woman is overweight, it's considered much more of a problem. She's considered much less attractive than if a man is overweight. And I'll give you an example of this. The um, Surgeon General um, in the last administration was a man. And in this administration, Obama appointed a black woman. And there was all this hue and cry when she was appointed to this position because this woman is overweight. And she's about 20 or 30 pounds overweight, maybe just 20, I'm not sure. But she's plump, right? She's not obese, she's just plump. Um, well, it turns out that if you actually were to look at the man who was a Surgeon General for many years before her, he is as overweight, if not more overweight, than she is, right? But nobody seemed to notice his weight, his excess weight, whereas everybody immediately noticed her weight. And so one of the ways in which gender affects women is that we tend to have, you know, very, very kind of narrow expectations for women, very narrow um, criteria that you have to fall within to be considered feminine or to be considered attractive if you're a woman. Uh, whereas men, a lot of men have pot bellies, they may be 30 pounds overweight with a pregnant belly, and they will consider themselves not particularly overweight or not particularly unattractive, and women will also say, well, it's, it's okay, right? Um, same with hair. You know, women are supposed to put a lot of effort into their hair, but a man can be bald. And bald men are not considered particularly unattractive. In fact, we have this notion that bald men are somewhat distinguished, and there's kind of an association between baldness and, you know, power and authority. So a lot of men in power in this country are bald. And so there's a way in which baldness has been normalized and, ex and considered acceptable, right? Um, so whether you're a male or a female determines, you know, how your, your size, your hair, and your clothes will be viewed and, you know, what kind of uh, constrictions there are and what choices you can make. Personality. We have certain expectations for people based on whether we think they're a male or a female, right? So, you know, there's an association of masculinity with aggressive behavior and with leadership, an association of femininity with passive behavior and with kind of following. And so if a woman is too aggressive or um, tries to play too much of a leader role, there are these kind of comments that are made like, oh, she's emasculating the men, or she's trying to wear the pants in the family, right? Or she's, you know, out of her place, or she's acting in a... In a uh, unfeminine way, right? We have notions of women as being more frivolous and men being more serious, right? So there's often, there's just a lot of jokes out there. You should pay attention, now that you're in this class, to the jokes you hear about women and men, right? And what you should pay attention to is that a lot of the jokes about women are denigrating and degrading. They actually 
point to flaws and weaknesses of women. And a lot of the jokes about men, which appear to be making fun of men, actually either glorify behaviors they engage in, which are to their benefit, or in some way um, belittle or kind of um, make less important some of their flaws. So an example. We might often joke about how um, men don't listen when, when women talk. And, oh, that's so funny that men just, you know, they just can't, aren't capable of listening. They just, they're just not good listeners, right? And we tend to make biologically essentialist arguments about it. Oh, well, you know, you can't expect a man to listen to his girlfriend or his, his uh, daughter or his wife because, you know, men just don't listen. Ha, ha, ha. Right? And so a joke like that actually enables men to continue to be insensitive and self-centered. Um, and it actually gives them power. Whereas the jokes we make about women tend to disempower women, right? So we say things like, well, you know, women aren't that logical. They're not going to be good at, like, philosophy and science, right? Because their minds, they're just too emotional, right? That actually takes power away from women. By saying that women are incapable of engaging in certain kinds of activities because of their biology, we actually then justify their restriction from engaging in certain high-paying jobs or in having certain educational opportunities, right? Another example would be jokes about men being dirty. So we joke about, oh, men are so bad at housework, or they're so dirty, or they just tend to be dirty. There's this one commercial on TV where the, the, the wife says to the husband, you know, we have company coming over, you should freshen up. And his idea of freshening up is to take his T-shirt off, turn it inside out, and put it back on. And then she goes and gets all dialed up and, and takes a shower and t puts fresh clothes on. And then she gets some product out and, like, sprays it, some, like, Febreze or something to get rid of his odors. And it says, oh, women and men have different ideas of freshening up, right? So a joke like that actually enables men to do less work in the home. Oh, you know, the reason that the woman does all the housework is because I'm just no good at housework, you know? Men are just no good at housework. They're just dirty people, right? They're just naturally dirty, right? That actually disempowers women and empowers men. So the joke really isn't at the man's expense, right? So pay attention to the jokes we make. Okay, chick flicks versus guy flicks, right? Another kind of joke or way that we talk about gender um, where we assume that women like certain kinds of movies and men like other kinds of movies. And what kind of movies do women tend to like? Romances or kind of more frivolous movies that are just about relationships and love and, and romance. And men are into, like, you know, violent films and drama and serious subjects, right? Um, and so we, we have these ideas about men and women and there's all these jokes about, oh, chick flicks, right? So chick, uh, the, the term chick flick is actually derogatory. Oh, it's a chick flick, right? But we don't have an equivalent derogatory term for guy flicks. So you're never going to hear, you know, someone tease someone by saying, oh, you're into guy flicks, right? We just don't have the equivalent term, right? And that's true for a lot of jokes is that we have a lot of kind of degrading comments about women. And we don't have equivalent degrading comments for men. Right? Um, behavior. Right? How you walk is, is, is determined by your gender or how you're supposed to walk. Right? And so uh, you may have heard about this study that was done where these researchers found that when women and men walk down the street, that men never step out of the way. But women, whenever they come to a man, they step out of the way so the man can keep walking. Right? And then there's a kind of this expectation on the part of men that women are just going to get out of their way. Right? So men will often bump into women on like crowded subways or on streets. And women will often move out of the way, you know, and try to, you know, make sure they're not in the way. Um, and we also have, you know, like pimp walks for guys. And then we have, you know, prim and proper, you know, walks for women. Right? And, and you know, the ability to walk in heels is supposed to be a feminine trait. Right? Um, how you eat. Right? So there's this expectation that women are supposed to kind of pick at their food or eat a small amount. And men are just supposed to pig out. Right? And, and for a man to pig out is not a problem. Right? It's kind of a guy thing. Guys like to pig out and eat high-fat foods, pizza and meat and, you know, chicken wings. 
Um, but for a woman to engage in that kind of eating behavior would be considered unfeminine, right? And kind of rude, right? So we have different kind of notions of what manners you should have if you're a man or a woman. Um, how you sit, I already talked about, you know, spreading out versus sitting, you know, like a, like a lady. How clean you are, your manners, right? How you talk, how loud you are, right? So it's acceptable for men to speak very loudly in public spaces, but for a woman to speak very loudly, then that's kind of gets people, what's going on? Why is she talking? So what's wrong with her? Has she gone crazy, right? So we often talk about women being crazy. So when women get loud, they're hysterical. When men get loud, they're asserting themselves, right? Cognition. Um, in the example I gave earlier, we have this association of uh, men with logical and rational thought and women with emotional or irrational thought. So there are a lot of jokes about women being excessively emotional, not being able to think clearly, not being logical, being crazy. You should really look at sitcoms and notice how many times women are referred to as crazy, right, or in some way irrational, how often women are characterized that way. Um, moral behavior. You have some writings by Gilligan and Nottings and Bartke about how we have different expectations, different moral expectations of men and women. Uh, one good example that Bartke gives is this lack of reciprocity of care. So there's an expectation that women should take care of other people, especially if they're sick or in, in need of some kind of caretaking, you know, food, clothing, uh, nurturing when they're sick. But we don't have the same expectations for men. And so the, the extent of unreciprocated care, the extent to which women take care of men, but when women are then sick or in need of help, the extent to which they receive no reciprocal care from those men is really quite astounding, right? So you have some, 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 some really, you know, um, shocking statistics about, say, divorce rates and illness. If a man becomes ill with a, you know, a, a chronic illness or a, um, uh, a mortal illness, an illness that could kill him, um, the women that are with them tend to stick by them, nurture them, nurse them through their illness, stay in the hospital with them, etc., sacrifice their career. Uh, but the same is not true for men, that the divorce rate actually goes, is very high in marriages where women develop chronic illnesses or life-threatening illnesses. Right? It's not the same for when the men develop them. Why? Because women take care of the men, but men are unwilling to take care of the women, and so the relationship falls apart. Right? So we have different expectations of care, and that's just one different expectation we have of moral behavior. A more obvious um, differential in terms of moral behavior is we have very different sexual mores for men and women. So if a man has multiple sex partners, we might refer to him as a player or a pimp, and that's actually a positive thing. It shows that he's got something going on, that he has the ability to attract so many women. There is no equivalent term for a woman. A woman who sleeps with a lot of partners is a whore or a hoe or um, some other derogatory term. She's loose, she's wild, she's, um, you know, she's basically an immoral person, right? She lacks the ability to commit, right? Why? Because we have different moral expectations of women and men, in part because we have different notions of innate behavior. Women are supposed to innately desire one partner, and they're supposed to want to get married. Men don't want to get married. They have to get married, but they don't want to get married. Men naturally cheat because they naturally prefer multiple partners, right? So we have these notions of kind of instinctual um, needs based on, on gender that we then use to explain our differential expectations with regard to moral behavior. Okay. Now, notions of gender are also raced, so although we can make some generalizations about gender, we really have to look at the ways in which gender is defined differently in different ethnic and cultural groups and in, in terms of, of race. Right? So now Nodding's theory, for example, is based on a white hetero norm. And this happens in a lot of theories in feminism that white women put forth. They actually assume that all women are heterosexual, middle-class white women. And so then their theories don't end up really applying to, say, working-class women or lesbians or women of color or disabled women or any other women that don't fit into their norm, right? Because they have defined woman as heterosexual. They defined woman as white, right? Um, but we're not going to do that in this class, right? We look at all, we look at gender, race, class, sexuality. We're looking at all of it, right? 
So some other ways in which uh, gender is race, body types. So we actually, you know, different racial groups will tend to have different body types. A really obvious example is the butt. Black women tend to have larger butts than white women say. This isn't true for all black women or all white women, but there's a larger preponderance of larger posteriors in the African-American community, right? And we have an association in this society in the United States of a large butt with sexuality or with promiscuity, right? And that's a very convenient association because white women don't have big butts, so then that allows us to kind of have these negative... Um, notions of female sexuality in the black community that, that don't apply to white women, right? Um, so kind of associating small, petite bodies with femininity or with passivity or with, um, you know, gentle, feminine natures, and then associating kind of voluptuous bodies, big breasts or large um, derriers, derriers with, with, you know, promiscuity, right, also negatively affects women because you're born with a certain body type does that really tell people something about your sexual behavior, right? Um, hair. Um, we, we said earlier that, you know, hair is associated with femininity and masculinity. So, you know, women are considered to be less hairy than men. They have less body hair. And if they don't, they're supposed to remove all their body hair. So women actually devote a lot of time to removing all of the hair from their body, whereas men don't actually have to spend any time or money removing any hair from their body because men are supposed to be hairy and women are supposed to be bald all over, right? And so we have all of these razors and tweezers and waxing and, you know, a lot of time and money spent by women to remove hair, right? Why? Because we've defined femininity as hairlessness and masculinity as hairiness, right? Now, but this actually turns out to be racial because if you travel throughout the world, you will find that most of the people in the world don't have a lot of body hair. It's actually only certain racial groups that have a lot of body hair. So it's predominantly Europe and the Middle East and Northern Africa where people have a lot of body hair. In most of Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, in most of Asia, apart from South Asia, but, you know, most of East Asia, you know, people don't have a lot of body hair. So body hair really is, you know, a, a racial thing. And so how does that then affect our notions of masculinity and femininity? We look at someone like someone who's, say, Chinese, right? Chinese men don't tend to have a lot of body hair, and they also don't tend to have a lot of facial hair. Native American men also don't tend to have a lot of facial hair and a lot of body hair. If we associate hairiness with masculinity, we're going to see those men as less masculine, and that's exactly what happens. You know, East Asian men are often portrayed as less masculine than other men, okay? Um, and then the, same, the reverse happens for Asian women, right? That Asian American women, because they have almost no body hair, are seen as more feminine than, say, European or African American women, right? Also because they're very petite, right? And so then body size, which again is racial. Different racial groups have different body sizes. If that is defined in terms of masculinity and femininity, it's also going to be racialized. Skin color. We have notions of beauty, definitions of beauty, which are defined in terms of skin color. So fairness is defined as beautiful in most of the cultures in the world at this point because of colonialism and the spread of European culture. So that the wera in Latin culture, the light-skinned person in South Asia, the light-skinned person in China, right? All of these people, all of these women in these contexts are considered more beautiful. Skin color, light skin is associated with beauty, associated with feminine, uh, notions of femininity. So we need to talk about the way in which gender is sexualized, and we'll do that in the next talk.